Welcome to my presentation on faster minimization of tardy processing time on a single machine. My name is Nick Fisher, and this is joint work with Carl Bringman, Denny Hamelin, Devia Shabtai, and Philip Belnitz. In our work, we study the following very fundamental scheduling problem. You are given n jobs with processing times pj and deadlines dj, and your task is to compute a subset j of all jobs along with a feasible schedule for the jobs in J. Here, feasible means that you have to respect the deadlines. Now, this is an optimization problem, and the objective is to maximize the total processing time of all jobs in J. Okay. Uh, alternatively, as we, for instance, did in our title, you can refer to this problem as a minimization problem. Then the objective is to minimize the processing time of all jobs outside of J, of all tardy jobs, as we say. Now, this is arguably one of the easiest scheduling problems you can think of. There is very few data associated to an instance, and obviously the objective is very simple. So let me start by stating what this problem is not about. There are no weights attached to your instance. Okay, so the objective really is as plain as maximizing the total processing time of all jobs in J. We do not allow for preemption, which essentially means that we can never interrupt the execution of a job. When we, when we schedule a job, it is executed fully, then the next job follows. All right, we know all jobs in advance, so this is an offline problem, and also the arrival times of all our jobs are set to zero, uh, meaning that we can essentially always schedule any job, except, of course, that we have to keep the deadline. Uh, finally, we are in a single machine model. Now, all of this information about our problem is somehow summarized in this name here, in this special scheduling notation. Um, however, since the problem is so easy, I will just refer to it as the scheduling problem for the remainder of this talk. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, our instance consists of three jobs, the red, blue, and green jobs here of processing times 7, 10, and 4, respectively. Um, the deadlines are indicated by these dash lines of 12, 13, and 6. Okay. This here is, for instance, a solution, although a non-optimal one, right? So we can just decide to schedule the blue job starting at the very beginning. This takes a total of 10 processing units, uh, and we keep the deadline since this job finishes before its deadline at 13. Uh, I say it's non-optimal because there is a better solution. Consider, for instance, the, th the green and the red job, also scheduled right at the beginning and right after each, each other. Then the, these jobs also keep their deadlines, as you can see. So this is feasible. And moreover, it is of total processing time 4 plus 7, which is equal to 11, which is a little bit better than the solution which just schedules, schedules the, the blue job. I did, however, not say that this is the only way of scheduling these two problems. We could, for whatever reason, also decide to take a break after uh, executing the green job. But let me immediately leave you here with this first insight about this problem. It never makes sense to actually do that, right? Whenever we have a schedule which includes breaks, we can just skip the breaks, shift all the jobs from the right to the left, and still have an optimal schedule without breaks. Okay. So what is known about this problem? As I said, it's, it's very fundamental. So it, it was studied a lot, at least implicitly. Um, as a special case of many other scheduling problems. So first of all, the problem is NP-hard. This is easy to see by reduction from the subset sum problem. Um, let me briefly outline that reduction. So in the subset sum problem, you're given a set of numbers and target. And the question is, does there exist a subset of numbers which adds up to the target? So we can just take these numbers as jobs, assign the processing times to the respective numbers, and all deadlines are equal to the target. Now there exists a feasible schedule with total processing time equal to the target if and only if the subset sum instance was satisfiable. Okay, so yeah, the problem is NP-hard, but not in a strong sense because there actually exists pseudo-polynomial time algorithms for our problem. There exists this very classical algorithm from uh, Lawler and Moore, which was developed now more than 50 years ago, trans in time order n times p, where p is the sum of all processing times in our instance, okay? Um, if we view this algorithm 
parameterized not both in n and p, but actually in, in p only, then the running time becomes order p squared. And that is because we can always lower bound p by n, as it never makes sense to have jobs of processing time zero. Okay, and perhaps surprisingly, this algorithm was never improved since then. So the natural question is, well, is order of p squared optimal? Or can we maybe do better? Um, it's actually not too hard to show that for a slight generalization of our problem, order p squared is optimal. Okay, so if we add weights to our instance and the objective is not to maximize the total processing time, but instead the total weights, uh, weight of all jobs, which we decided to schedule, then one can show that order p squared is optimal, at least if you believe in some plausible assumption from Frank and complexity. Uh, the reason is essentially that this correspondence to the subset sum problem, which I just outlined, now becomes a correspondence to a knapsack problem. And uh, this really takes quadratic time under uh, that plausible conjecture. Okay. Well, another very natural question is, um, what about other parameterizations? Here are two other plausible parameters, right? Let's take capital D, uh, capital D to be the sum of all deadlines and D sharp to be the number of distinct deadlines. Uh, now it's very easy to think about uh, think of instances where these two parameters are relatively small while p is rather large. Can we do better in these scenarios? So in our work, we make progress towards both of these questions. As a first result, we show that the scheduling problem can be solved in time. O, o tilde mainly hides, uh, yeah, just hides log factors. So there might be an additional log square p hidden there. Um, I will talk about the proof of this result later in detail. For now, let me just leave you with these two hints on how it might look like. So uh, first we establish a fine-grained reduction to a convolution-like problem. Fine-grained meaning that the reduction closely preserves the running time and then carries over improvements of that convolution-like problem to our scheduling problem. Okay, and the second step, well, we just improve the convolution-like problem. Um, the main tool, as it turns out, is the fast free transform. Okay, so we can actually solve our scheduling problem in time p to the seven quarters, which is, of course, an improvement in the case where p is relatively small in comparison to n. Um, as another result, we prove theorem two. Um, the scheduling problem can also be solved in time o tilde of the minimum of p times d sharp or p plus d. Okay, so this is a running time which really takes these new parameters into account. Um, however, I will not be talking about this result in detail. I will just leave you with the hint that uh, for the proof we also use FFT, but in a very different way. Okay. Now, um, for the remainder of the talk, I will be essentially only talking about this proof here, starting with a precise formulation of this convolution-like intermediate problem. Afterwards, then we'll, we'll have a look at these two steps individually. Okay. So the intermediate convolution-like problem will be called a skewed convolution problem. But for now, let me just start with the regular convolution problems because there is actually some, some interesting, uh, there are some interesting results out there. Okay, so let A and B be vectors of dimension N. We say that the convolution of A and B is a vector C of dimension 2n minus 1, where the kth coordinate is determined by this expression here. Okay, so this is a sum over all pairs of indices i and j, such that i plus j is equal to k, where we take a i times bj. Of course, summation and multiplication here uh, can be substituted for more general operators, as we did in this definition here by writing O plus and O times for addition and multiplication. However, at least for starters, it makes sense to just think about plus and O plus and O times as regular addition and multiplication. So let me give you this example. Um, here, A and B are dimension three vectors. A is equal to two, zero, one. B is equal to one, three, one. But think of B as being written in a reversed way. Now, how do we compute the vector C? for a pair of indices i is two times one. What we're essentially doing is we're sliding b over a, so we're sliding b to the right-hand side. 
And we always have this active window where A and B overlap. Now the respective value in C is determined as the coordinate wise product or the inner product of this active window of A and B. Right. Um, so for instance, in this case, we have two times three plus zero times one, which is six. Uh, here we have two times one plus zero times three plus one times one, which is three and so on. In the end again, we only have one pair of indices, which adds up to four, which is well, two plus two. Okay, now this is a purely mathematical definition, but of course we can turn this easily into an algorithmic problem, right? So the input is A and B as vectors, the output is the vector C. How fast can you compute this? Um, right, so there's a very classical algorithm which is called fast Fourier transform, which solves the regular integer convolution in time near linear. Um, another way of viewing this problem here is as polynomial multiplication. Yeah, but actually other convolution variants are also quite prominent. Uh, for instance, there is the max-min convolution problem, um, which is somewhere intermediate and takes time O tilde of n to the three halves. Um, there's also the min plus convolution problem, which takes quadratic time. At least this is a conjecture in fine-grained complexity theory. Um, so there is a rich complexity uh, this is a rich complexity landscape of these convolution-like problems, and although they share that much structure, they really have very different running times. Now, what I will present to you is a variant of this max-min uh, max convolution problem. For the moment, it will probably not make sense why we actually introduced this problem, but that will be clear as soon as we get to the, the proof or the first part of the proof of theorem 1. So here it is. Uh, the max-min skewed convolution of two vectors a and b is again a vector c, where the kth coordinate is determined as the maximum over all i plus j equals to k. Okay, that's essentially what we expected. Now we take the minimum of a i and b j. That would be the convolution, but we take the minimum of a i and b j minus i. Okay, so we skew the right-hand side of this minimum operand slightly. Um, Observe that if this was a j in place of i, bj minus j, then the problem would not differ because then we could just recombine bj minus j, j into a new vector. But as it is, this really becomes a new problem and actually a harder problem. So it fits here into the complexity landscape. We can solve maximum skewed convolution in time o tilde of n to the seven quarters. Of course, so far it's not, we, we cannot prove a lower bound uh, against this problem, but it's at least as hard as the maximum co uh, convolution problem. Okay, so this is the intermediate problem. Um, I will now continue to first give you the reduction from the scheduling problem to this intermediate problem and then show you how to actually obtain this improvement. Okay, here's the precise lemma uh, of the reduction from the scheduling problem to the maximum skewed convolution problem. Suppose that we can solve maximum skewed convolution in time t of n well, then we can solve the scheduling problem time t of p with an additional overhead of log p. Um, for the proof, for let's say the proof sketch, I first have to give you a definition. Let L of i and t, where i is a subset of jobs and t is a point in time, be the latest point in time after which a subset of jobs in i admits a feasible schedule with processing time exactly t. Okay, let's take it slow. As an example, again, this is, this is the example from the very beginning. Consider the set of jobs which includes the red and the green job and set t equals to 11. Now, what's the latest point in time after which we can schedule, well, a subset of the red and the green job of processing time exactly 11? This is one. Because for processing time 11, we really have to schedule both jobs. And if we were to schedule them any later than one, say at two, well, then we would violate at least uh, then we would violate at least one of the deadlines. Um, L of the same set of jobs, but t equals to nine is undefined because there just exists no subset of the red and the green job of processing time exactly nine. So let's set this to minus infinity. Finally, uh, the last example, um, the L value of the same set with processing time four. Well, this is the only subset which makes sense is taking the green job here. And that we can actually schedule at two but at two by latest because anything later than two would violate the deadline of the green job. Okay. Now, given this definition, 
I claim that we can prove the following fact. First, we reorder all the jobs such that their deadlines are increasing. So the deadline of the first job is less or equal than the deadline of the second job and so on. Now take an interval of jobs, so a set of consecutive jobs in that order, and split it into other intervals. Okay, so the only thing which I'd like to guarantee here is that all the deadlines in I1 are less or equal than all the deadlines in I2. Then this holds. What does it mean? Well, the latest point in time after which we can schedule a subset of I with processing time exactly T, this is the maximum over all ways of splitting T into T1 plus T2, where we now spend T time T1 on the first part and time T2 in the second part. This here is supposed to be the latest point in time after which we can schedule both jobs from I1 with processing time T1 and jobs from I2 with processing time T2. Okay, this is what I will show you now, at least by proof of picture. Um, but as a first insight, notice that it always makes sense to schedule all jobs from I1 before all jobs from I2. Uh, this is somehow called an early deadline first schedule. Um, and in our setting, it's always true that whenever there exists an optimal solution, then there exists an optimal solution with this property. So let me argue that this is actually the correct expression. Say T1 and T2 are of these lengths. Okay, then there are two cases. Either the left-hand side, the, the top side, the minimum is smaller. So the, uh, the jobs in the first part have to be scheduled very early. Well, if that happens, then the best thing which we can do is we just schedule the jobs from the first part followed by those from the second part. Of course, we have to start at this point at L of I1 and T1 because if we were to start any later, then we would actually violate the constraint that we can schedule jobs from the first part. The second part is slightly more interesting. Suppose the minimum is attained by this expression here. Now, what does it mean? Then, well, the, uh, the L of I1 and T1 is somewhere later than L of I2, T2 minus the processing time which we need for the first part. Then we actually cannot start here because we cannot schedule the jobs of, of the second part later on. That would violate this deadline here. So instead, we actually have to start at this point, right? Take the this point at which we really have to start all the jobs in the second part, but we have to subtract the length of all jobs in the first part. Okay, so I hope that you believe me that this expression here actually makes sense. Uh, and maybe it's obvious that this is actually exactly the same statement, exactly the same term as in the definition of the maximum skewed convolution problem, right? So this is the where this weird offset of minus the first index comes from. So given that we have computed this value for all values of T1 and this value for all values of T2, we can now actually compute this value for all values of T using a single call to the maximum skewed convolution problem. That's essentially what this claim is about. This brings us to the following algorithm. We start with the full set of jobs, I. Um, our Goal is no longer to just compute a solution to the problem, but we want to just we want to compute this full table of all values L of i and t. Um, and this is a recursive algorithm. First, we split the set of all jobs into two parts, i1 and i2. Um, the splitting is done in such a way that the total processing time of all jobs in i1 is equal to roughly p half. Okay, so the same also holds for the total processing time for all the jobs in I2. We then can compute the table L of I1 and L of I2 recursively and use a single call to the maximum skewed convolution problem to get the table of L of I. Um, okay, this continues of course now uh, until we reach the singleton sets and for the singleton sets, there is also a very efficient way to write down this full table. Um, so what's the running time of this procedure? By this, okay, the correctness follows because we have just at least sketched the proof of this claim uh, and right, we apply this claim in every step. So what's the correctness? Uh, what's the running time? Per level, we spend order of T of P time. This is just because we have to run on each level. On the on topmost level, we run a single maximum skewed convolution problems. Of, uh, right, we run a single maximum skewed convolution instance. On all levels below, we use a convexity argument. 
Now there are at most log p many levels, so the total time is uh, t of p with an overhead of log p. Now finally that we have computed this table L of i and t, we can recover the optimal value for the scheduling problem by taking the maximum entry for which t, uh, for the, the maximum t for which this entry is still finite. Okay. This concludes the reduction to the skewed convolution problem. Uh, I will now give you a very brief overview on how to improve the skewed convolution problem. The precise statement is that we get this running time of O tilde of n to the seven quarters. Okay. For the algorithm, we'd like to compute this quantity here, right? The vector c, where in each coordinate, uh, ck, we have this expression. But actually, it's the same to compute it, this expression where we have plus k here instead of minus i. This is just a minor step by rewriting these vectors a and b in some way. This is the algorithm. We have roughly log n many levels, where on the lth level we compute this vector, which is well slightly different from the one which we'd like to compute, because instead of taking a i, b j, and, and k, we take versions where we divide these quantities by 2 to the l and round down. Of course, at the 0th level, these vectors are just the same. So at this, if we can compute this value on the 0th level, then we're done. On the L plus first level, I claim, we can actually compute this value. Uh, log n plus first level, sorry. Um, that is because then this term here vanishes. So the problem deforms to a maximum convolution and that we can compute in time n to the three halves. So what I really only have to argue about is how to get from this L plus uh, log n plus first level to the zeroth level, okay? So assume that we have computed the L plus first level. Then we do two steps. First, we compute this quantity, this vector tilde C, um, which is a constant error approximation of CL. Constant error meaning that in every coordinate, um, C and C tilde differ by at most an additive offset of two. Okay, and that's actually easy to achieve because we can just assign this approximation to be twice the exact value of the, of the uh, level below. Right, because the only thing which we have to now take care of is that, well, here we took, we, uh, we divided by two to the L plus one and then rounded down. Well, due to the rounding issues, now we get an, an uh, additive error of one here, one here and one here. So the total error is at most two. Okay, so we can, this is actually, this is cool. We can compute uh, an added, an, a constant error approximation of the vector which we'd like to compute. So the question is now how to turn this approximation into an exact solution. If we can do that on every level, right, then we were, we're done with the algorithm. Um, okay, so I will be very sketchy. First, we simplify and we'll only consider those indices for which this minimum here is attained as by the left-hand side. Okay, so this is actually attained by the left-hand side. The right-hand side is greater or equal than the left-hand side. If we only focus on these indices, then the following idea works out. We call an index k light if the number of candidate left-hand side entries is rough, is at most n to the three quarters, is small. Okay, and how can we check whether something is a candidate? Well, we compare it to the approximation which we have just computed. We call an index heavy otherwise. So let's do it as follows. For all light indices k, we brute force over all possibilities on the left-hand side, over all values ai by 2 to the l. There are not too many just by the definition of a light index. Afterwards, we sparsify by just throwing away all these entries and setting them to minus infinity. Okay, we only throw away those which did not occur too often, so those which correspond to light indices k. What remains is an instance where there are just not too many entry, uh, not too many values ai by 2 to the l. So for each remaining entry v, we just check whether there exists some in, some pair of indices i plus j equal to k such that the left-hand side entry is equal to v, but well bj by two to the l plus k by two to the l is greater or equal than v. Uh, this is of course very abstract, but we can actually do that by a single call to the maximum skewed uh, by the maximum convolution problem. Okay, by a single call per value v. Um, now the details are actually 
more tedious. So this really gives you something like the idea, but you have to be careful when, when actually implementing this algorithm. But uh, yeah, as it turns out, you, you need time n to the seven quarters because in this light step, well, we have to take care of each index k and there are at most n to the three quarters possibilities. In the heavy step, we ha only have at most n to the one quarter many values v left. For each, we have to execute a maximum convolution. Okay. Right. So very sketchy, this concludes the proof of um, the O tilde of n to the seven quarters algorithm. Right, that's nearly it. Um, let me briefly wrap up and mention some open problems. Uh, so we have seen this, um, our first result uh, in detail, so proving that the scheduling problem can be solved no tilde of p to the seven quarters time. I also mentioned that we get a better algorithm parametrized by uh, these other parameters, the number of distinct deadlines and well, the sum of all deadlines. Um, okay, well, the most obvious open problem is can we solve maximum skewed convolution even faster than n to the seven quarters? That would be very nice because an improvement for maximum skewed convolution carries over to the scheduling problem immediately. Uh, but maybe we can also show some sort of conditional lower bound against this running time. Um, another question is, well, can we generalize the algorithm for the scheduling problem to the setting of multiple machines? Okay, so the Lawler moore algorithm actually takes time n times p to the m in the setting where we have m parallel machines. But it's really not clear how our approach would generalize. Uh, finally, are there other scheduling problems which could benefit from a similar treatment, from some sort of similar reduction to a convolution-like intermediate problem? Right. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.